Hello everyone, my name is Xu Xu Liu. I am a senior engineer at Changes working at the Vlopi Center. Today, I will talk about the Thai fastener project we have been working on, spike loading and failure modes. The background of this research originates from several recent derailments caused by broken spikes. Those broken spikes were found typically on the curved track with elastic fastener system. The breakage location of the spike was found usually 1.5 to 2 inches below the surface of the timber tie. This slide shows some pictures taken after the derailment in Vandergrift, Pennsylvania. In this picture, you can see the timber ties were severely damaged and also you can see the damage location of the broken spikes below the surface of the timber tie. UIUC conducted several industry surveys to understand how big of the problem is to the railroad. The results show that at least 10 mainline derailments since 2000 are caused by broken spikes. Frequent spike failures in Elastic fastening systems are common. Eight out of nine railroads have experienced a rapid gauge deterioration in broken spike clusters. Last but not the least, finding broken spike is very hard because you have to physically walk on the track and tap the spikes one by one. So, in this presentation, we are aiming to investigate the root causes for the spike failure in elastic fastening systems used in timber ties. We want to understand the failure modes of the broken spikes and also what level of forces are required to initiate the failure in the individual spike. What is the force distribution mechanism to transfer the force to the spike? In the following presentation, those questions will be answered using numerical models we developed. This slide shows the load path and the respective models we used for each path. For example, from the rail to the plate, there's a wheel and thermal load applied on the top of the rail. The wheel and the thermal load then distribute to the plate, we call it plate load. How the load is distributed to the plate depends on the fastener stiffness and whether anchors exist or no. To estimate the magnitude of the play load, we used an analytic model composed of vertical, lateral, and longitudinal spring series to calculate the play load. Next, the play load is then distributed to an individual spike. We call it spike load. This load path is affected by friction between play and tie and spike engagement within the plate. To estimate the spike load required to initiate spike failure, we built a finite element model as shown in this figure. This model is composed of a single spike, a plate, and a timber of tie. Taking different magnitude of the spike load as an input, we are able to see the minimum force required to initiate the spike failure. This slide shows the typical failure modes from the finite animal model. We use the plastic strain as an indicator for spike failure initiation. The contour on each spike shows where the failure would initiate under different loading scenario. Under the different loading conditions, the spike may experience lateral, longitudinal, and mixed bending failures. For example, under a combination of lateral and longitudinal loading, the spike has mixed bending mode and the failure occurred at the edge of the spike shaft. Here is a spike about to break found at the horseshoe curve. Comparing the actual spike with the combined bending failure in the, from the model, the failure mode and the breakage location from the model is very close to the actual spike. The picture on the right shows the wood damage by the end of the loading. The most severe damage of the tie is around the spike area located on the top of the tie. 
This slide shows the minimum spike load required to initiate the wood tie damage and the spike damage. What this figure tells us is that the curves are the threshold lines to cause wood spike damage. Any spike load inside the curve is considered as a safe load that is not going to cause the damage. Any loads outside the curve is going to initiate wood or spike failure. In this picture, we can see the spike load for wood damage is smaller than the spike load needed for spike failure initiation. Because the wood is an anisotropic material, so the longitudinal direction is much weaker than the lateral direction. Comparing the red and the blue curves with the quadrant line shown in gray, they are, they are not circle-alike curves which means that the spike load required in the lateral direction is not equal to the longitudinal direction. So you can see in the picture both the magnitude of the spike load to initiate the wood damage and the spike failure in longitudinal direction is smaller than in the lateral direction. So for example, if you look at the red curve, which shows the spike failure initiation, only 2300 pound of longitudinal force is able to initiate the spike failure, but about 3,500 pounds if the load is applied along lateral direction is required to initiate the spike failure. Once we know the minimum spike load required to initiate spike failure, we want to understand how the load from the rail distributed to the spike. So here is the analytical model we used to answer this question. This model composed of vertical, longitudinal, and the lateral spring series. For the model input, we need to um, input the train information, and we would need to assume the stiffness of each springs, then run the model, and we are able to obtain the playload in vertical, lateral, and the longitudinal directions. This figure shows the typical results we obtained from the analytical model. This is the results under two locomotives. Each locomotive has six axles. So in this figure, the black curve shows the vertical force, the red curve shows the lateral force, and the blue curve shows the longitudinal force. For the vertical and the lateral force, you can see 12 distinguished peak values under each wheel load. However, for the longitudinal force, the effect of wheel load is not very evident in this curve. This is because the stiffness of the longitudinal springs assumed in the model is not as large as the uh, lateral and the vertical springs. Also, in this figure, you can see um, a positive magnitude of the vertical force, which indicates the plate was uplifting um, at this location. So after we obtain those play load, we can incorporate the play load in the back in the finite element model. Then using the vertical force and the lateral force, we are able to calculate the friction force between the play and the tie. Then we get the spike load distribute uh, within a plate. We used these two models to understand the loading conditions at the horseshoe curve in Pennsylvania. The horseshoe curve has a very tight degree curvature with steep grade. There are two tracks, track one, downhill track without anchors. Fewer broken spikes were found at this track and track three, which is an uphill track with anchors. Lots of broken spikes, especially on the high road side were found at this track. To demonstrate our models, we pick one train from each track. The two trains have comparable axle weight and are running at very similar operating speed. This slide shows the instrumentation plan. There are strain gauges to measure the rail axle force. There are extensionometers um, attached to the tie and attach the to the plate to measure the displacement of tie relative to the plate and the displacement of the rail 
a relative to the plate in vertical, lateral, and longitudinal directions. Those measurements will be compared with the uh, model results as calibration purposes in the future. We use the measurements to calibrate our model. As discussed previously, one of the inputs for the model is the stiffness of the springs in all directions. The stiffness values were varied until the model results matched the measurements very well. The figure on the left shows the displacement of the plate relative to the tie under the first truck of the locomotive in vertical and lateral directions. The figure on the right shows the longitudinal rail force prior to the train coming. Both figures show the model had very good agreement with the measurements, so we are very comfortable with the parameters we chose in the model. Once the model is calibrated, we are able to take the train information into the model and calculate the play load under the train passes. This figure shows the model results for track 1 and track 3. The top figures are the lateral spike loads for each track. There are many, many load spikes on track 3, especially on the high rail. There are a few load peaks on track 1. For the longitudinal play load shown in the figure below, on track 1, the longitudinal load is very small and widely distributed through the whole train. This is because track 1 is the downhill track and the train is braking. The braking forces are distributed to each brakes under the each car. On track 3, the longitudinal force is almost 10 times larger than track 1, but only distributed among the front, the front of the train. This is because track 3 is the uphill track and the train was in traction. The traction force are provided by the locomotives, so the longitudinal forces are only distributed to the locomotives. If we change the format of the figure from the previous slide and plot as an x-axis of lateral spike load and the y-axis as a longitudinal spike load, you'll get scatter points as shown in this slide. We overlaid these scatter points with the failure initiation curve we talked about earlier. We are able to evaluate the effect of the loading environment at the Horseshoe curve. Here, we assume 100% of the play load goes into one spike and the coefficient of friction between the play and tie is 0.3. Again, compared with the spike failure initiation curve shown in red, the scatter points Inside the curve are the loads that are not going to initiate the spike failure. The scatter points outside the red curve are the critical loads that cause spike failure initiation. On track 1, you can see a few lateral spike loads exceeded the curve, and on track 3, there are some lateral spike loads and also a combined lateral and longitudinal spike load outside the curve. This slide compares the effect of coefficient of friction between the plate and the tie. The coefficient of friction has no effect on the longitudinal spike load because they are loaded when the plate is uplifted. But the coefficient of friction does affect the lateral spike load. When the coefficient of friction increased from 0.3 to 0.7, the friction between plate and the tie increased. The percentage of the play load transferred to each spike decreased. So the majority of the lateral spike load was shifted inside the curve when the coefficient of friction is up to 0.7. This slide evaluates the effect of spike engagement by assuming 100%, 75%, 50%, and 25% of the play load distributed to each spike. Ideally, if there are four spikes in a plate, each spike would get even load distribution from the plate, which is 25. However, this is not always the case on the field. From previous field investigation, one spike could take over 70% of the load while leaving other spikes are unloaded. This figure tells us two things. Number one, 
as the percentage of the payload distributed to each spike decreases, more spike loads fall inside the spike failure initiation curve, which indicates those loads are safe. Number two, when one of the spikes fails or misses, the rest of the spikes would take more percentage of the load, which would shift the spike load outside the failure initiation curve and increase the risk of spike failure initiation. Coming into conclusion, the magnitude of longitudinal forces during traction are large compared to braking forces. The traction forces are distributed over a large number of tie plates. The longitudinal plate forces are applied directly to spike due to uplift condition. Vertical lateral forces are distributed over a few number of tie plates. Lateral plate forces are reduced by plate type friction. Broken spikes on the downhill track, which is track 1 at the horseshoe curve, likely result from significant lateral loading condition. Broken spikes on the uphill track, track 3 at the horseshoe curve, likely results from a mixed loading condition with lateral and longitudinal loads. With the presence of longitudinal loads on track 3, less lateral loads are needed to initiate the spike failure. Last but not least, non-uniform track engagement results in excessive forces transferred into one spike, which accelerates the failure of the spike. In the end, I'd like to acknowledge FRA for supporting the work and also thank UIUC for providing the field data for model validation. Thanks.